Welcome to Saturday Morning Rewind, a show dedicated to the love of animation and feeling like a kid again. Let's go back in time to when cats defended Third Earth. Sword of Omens, give me sight beyond sight. A masked duck protected the streets of St. Canard. I am the terror that flaps in the night. And knowing was half the battle. Yo, Joe! Let's go back with Saturday Morning Rewind and your host, Tim Nidell. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of Saturday Morning Rewind with your host, Tim Nidell. Make sure to follow me online. It's at Saturday Rewind, or my personal accounts are at Tim underscore Nidell. And I just want to welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in to this very special episode, the 200th episode of the podcast. For the 200th episode, I don't see a better fit than having the amazing Noel Blank on the podcast. And of course, he is the son of the one and only man of a thousand voices, Mel Blank. Uh, maybe if I'm real sweet, Uncle Tex will adopt me. <laughs> uh, 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 what's the big idea? I ordered a canary and uh, not a dog. If there's any giving away cigars, you 70 Sam will give them. Who, me? Oh, I know uh, lots of things. Two and two is four. Carson City is the capital of Nevada. Buster, it may come as a complete surprise to you to find that this is an animated cartoon. I claim this planet in the name of Mars. I think we may need to get Noel on again because I can just talk to him for hours, not just about his dad either. And that's what the focus of this interview is, talking all about Mel Blanc. But before I play the interview, I do need to give a quick shout out to my amazing Patreon supporters. First off, to my executive producer of this episode, Mike Clemens. Thank you again for your support. And to my producers of this episode, Tori Garvin, Gemma Bright, Alan S86, and Luis Alvarez. Thank you all so very much. And if you're listening and you do want to help us out, check out our website, SaturdayMorningRewind.com. You'll find the donation section there. That is where all the Patreon information is and the link to sign up. It starts at only $2 a month, and it goes up to $15. Of course, if you want to give a one-time donation as well, you can always do that through Patreon too. Hey, Toonsters, this is Buster Bunny. No relation to Babs Bunny. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you this very important interview from Saturday Morning Rewind. No, thank you. So much for your time. This really, really means a lot. I, I don't really need to say it, but I'm gonna say it anyways. Without your dad's work in the in the uh, voiceover world, my childhood would not be the same. And that goes for millions of other people out there like me. So thank you for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. You know, it's very uh, strange to hear a person not say they didn't grow up with the Looney Tunes. Yes. No matter what country they were in, I always kid them. I said, you know, you grew up with my dad and myself. Yeah. Oh, what do you mean? They, they, it kind of strikes them strangely when I say that, and then I explain, and they say, "Oh my gosh, that's all we did as a kid is watch Looney Tunes." He made a lot of people happy during his life, that's for sure. Yeah, Looney Tunes. Um, if I remember correctly, in the early '80s, it was the end of the uh, Saturday morning block for me, and when I grew up in Reno, so I think it came on around 11 a.m. and it lasted till noon, and. That's when the cartoons were over. So I lasted. I waited till Looney Tunes came on, and uh, it was a highlight of Saturday mornings for me. Oh yes, it was a, and you know before that, every day uh, you could find a channel that he was on uh, almost twenty four hours a day. It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, they play Looney Tunes nonstop on so many different channels. Yeah, uh, in the nineties and two thousand. Yeah, it's got to be great for you to know that at any point you can turn anywhere and you can find your dad. Yeah, at one time, that was really easy to do. Uh, not so easy now, that's for sure. Yeah. Because you have so many different channels. Uh, but I imagine if you go to, uh, you know, any of the uh, the kids' channels, and uh, you'll find them on at least a couple times a day. Yep, yep. So before we dive in 
to talk about your dad. I want to know more about you. What, what was what was your childhood like growing up in the uh, Blink House? Well, I was an only child, so I had uh, my dad and mom to, to myself, and it was really wonderful because my dad was a very, very funny person, and so was my mom. So we our, our household was full of laughter all the time, and it still is now. I married Catherine, who is... Uh, was our comedy writer when she was 19. I met her about 38 years ago, 40 oh, years ago. Wow. And uh, she was a comedy writer then at 18, 19 years old. And uh, we worked together for many years before we even got married. But uh, laughter is the key yep. to having a happy household, I think. <laughs> and it was sure full of laughs. I used to attend uh, many of the radio shows my dad was on. I wasn't able to sit in the audience uh, at that time because they didn't allow children... Uh, under 12 to sit in the audience. So I sat in the sponsor's booth Wow! with the director and the sponsor and the advertising agencies that did all the radio shows. Uh, they had their people uh, in, in the sponsor's booth. Uh, I don't know if you remember that there were, you know, you wouldn't because you're too young, but mm -hmm. uh, in the, the heyday of radio, which was only a 25 year period, most of the radio shows were sponsored by the product. So you'd see the the Chevy show with whoever it might be, or the Lucky Strike program starring uh, Jack Benny, okay. or the uh, Old Gold program, or whatever it is. A lot of cigarette sponsors, but their <laughs> name always came first. And uh, so I got to sit in the sponsors booth and enjoy all the shows as a little kid. Also, nice. So you just were you able. To, so you wouldn't you couldn't sit in the audience, but they let you in the sponsors booth. That's, awesome. That's right. I don't think I ever, during the heyday of radio, I never sat in the, in the audience. <laughs> when television came, of course, and Jack Benny went to TV, then I was able to sit in the audience and go yeah. backstage after. Man, that must have just been a hoot as a kid, just to experience. It was wonderful because I remember sitting on Gracie Allen's lap oh, during man. the radio show uh, uh, rehearsals. My dad would take me to rehearsals, and I could sit on Gracie's lap or sitting next to George Burns or Jack Benny. It was uh, it was wonderful to see. The, the sound effects man always was amazing to me also. Because uh -huh. he could make anything, any sounds that you know of. And he had just a little station there with everything that he that he worked on that could make all these wonderful sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is another field that I'm just amazed with, you know, taking out an old leather wallet, making it creak to sound like, you know, footsteps oh, yes. and that kind of stuff. It's amazing. Or squishing cellophane together to make a fire sound. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Crazy. Or the doors, the doors that open and close, the little uh, doors that look like uh, regular doors, only half size. Yeah. And the sound effects man would sit next to one, open the door with the doorknob, close the door, uh, walking on gravel. Uh, he had gravel, he had stone, he had cement, he had uh, a hardwood that he could walk on. And you got, the sound effects were pretty good that time. I know. And it's done all, done all live with the radio. And nowadays, I don't know if they even do that. I'm, I'm imagine they don't really do that anymore nowadays. No, you don't have the sound effects men said at a uh, wonderful uh, council and press the button. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> sure. <laughs> what about growing up with your friends? What did your friends think of uh, your dad? Well, our house was always the hub of the. I grew up in Plato Ray where there were only about 100 people there at that time. And uh, now, of course, Plato Ray uh, is in Westchester are all fully formed and there's thousands there. But at the time, 1938, 39, 40, 41, 42, during the war years, we were right in the middle of uh, blackouts every night mm -hmm. and barrage balloons and ACAC -ac guns. And it was uh, mm -hmm. close to the uh, World War II as you could get. Uh, in the United States because uh, they always expected uh, some submarine or some aircraft to be off the coast. Uh, that Pearl Harbor had been so scary to most people. But uh, it was fun growing up. My mom would make baked beans for the soldiers, run them up to them. <laughs> My dad would entertain them. Uh, it, we had a lot of encampments around the Plato Ray Hills area since there were so few houses. And behind us was Mines Field, the Air Force Field. So it was as close to growing up to World War II as anyone could mm -hmm. as a child. 
and uh, the house was always full of laughter inside, and uh, we were pretty uh, quiet on the outside with the the blackouts and the dimouts, and uh, we didn't talk much at night. Hmm. But uh, radio held us together. That was amazing. We always had a radio on, yeah, uh, even though quietly at night. And uh, always, my mom was a wonderful uh, cook, and my dad was too, and the family was very close. Uh, when he would go to work, I would go with him a lot of times. As a kid, you know, working with all these wonderful stars of radio at that time was was a thrill because I knew who they were, and then I'd listen to them in the air and uh, see the show being made, and then go home and listen to the trans- transcription. Hmm. So it was it was a fun place. You've mentioned your mom a couple of times, and she's somebody I really don't know much about. Tell me a little bit about your mom. My mom was an amazing mom, that's for sure, and. Uh, very, very bright woman, uh, very loving, uh, you know, would teach what they didn't teach in school. She taught me uh. and, uh, just, it was really a, a good growing up that way was really a good life. I have to admit, yeah. I was one of the very lucky people and being an only child is pretty lucky also, I think, <laughs> <clears throat> but I used to, uh, listen to my dad all the time at home too. And he'd use tell a lot of the stories at home and make up stories, make up voices. <laughs> Whenever we take a trip, a, a, a car trip, uh, he would look around and make voices for the various animals. Um, it was really, uh, in, he was entertaining in the car. That's for sure. Uh, that's and my mom was a great audience as was I. Would he ever come home and uh, test out a new voice for you to see what you thought? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Very much so. Do you remember which characters um, he may have done that for? Twee, Sylvester, the later wow. Speedy Gonzalez. Um, when the fellow that played uh, uh, Arthur Lang died, um, the pay, played... Uh, 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 Elmer Fudd? Elmer Fudd, yeah. When he died, uh, sure. Uh, my dad would... Uh, he didn't want to do... He, didn't, he hated to imitate voices. But they tried out a lot of people, and he ended up doing Elmer Fudd after uh, he died. At, uh, I guess 1956. After 1956, he was Elmer Fudd also. So he he did the whole the whole shebang, except uh, maybe Granny. There were about yep. uh, three or four Grannies, uh, and uh, but aside from that, he was doing most of the voices, or almost all of them. Actually, there'd be a few characters that. Uh, if they were uh, characters of the same uh, animal ilk that talk mm-hmm. to each other, if he didn't do both of them, uh, they'd bring in somebody to do one or a couple of the voices. Like Stan Freeberg. Uh, well, he, he, and well, Stan was uh, quite young at that time, so it wasn't Stan most of the time. Stan was Stan really started in uh, television when he was young mm-hmm. with Time for Beanie, you know, which was a puppet show at that time. But uh, before that, there was a fellow Joe Kearns, Hans Conrad. Sheldon okay. Leonard, people, the names of the past that used to come in and do a voice or two. Oh, hmm. yeah. It was uh, thrilling to meet them, too. And then we had a cabin up at Big Bear, which we go to about six months out of the year still. Uh, we got the best lot on the lake for 600 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's still the same cabin oh, with the same furniture that uh, Jack Benny and George Burns, Lucille Ball, the oh, whole bunch gosh. used to come up on the... Uh, on summer, during my summer vacation, wow, and uh, sleep there and have midnight uh, chocolates and marshmallows and s'mores and whatever we could eat. And uh, I was just a kid up there. Yeah. I think they built it in 1946, and uh, we go up there for six months um, and uh, enjoy the same furniture <laughs> and the same house. It's mostly it's like a little museum. The yeah, same it would be. When the lake is up, we're only about 15 feet from the lake, and we can see the whole lake from the front porch. And yeah. the same boats. That we were <laughs> everything, everything is pretty much the same up there. Same boat, same car. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh! I mean, it's it's like a, it's 50, like a time machine when you go back. Then just takes you oh, back yeah. to the good couple old days. Fifty one Merc, couple of fifty one Merc lead sleds up there uh, that we drive, and the boat 
still named Bugs Bunny and Chris <laughs> Draft from 1952. And my own little boat, Tweety, uh, a little speed liner from 1948. Oh, yeah. Man. It's all there. That's amazing. That is amazing. Gosh. Yeah. So how did you get to be uh, on the radio like this? You know, I started it, actually, um, I started it after my father passed away. So 10 years ago, my my dad had a heart attack at the age of 57, and he passed away. And I wanted to, yeah, very, very young. I wanted to uh, relive my childhood because he gave me an amazing childhood, him and my mom did. And I just started doing, you know, I started interviewing the voices that I grew up with. And that's that's how I've been doing it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's a little And there trendy. were a lot of voices. Oh, of course, yeah. That I mean, you grew up with. Yes. Oh, yeah. Almost a endless. Lot of wonderful. I think the performers that at the time you grew up, uh, we're starting to be the major movie stars. So we're getting paid huge money. Yeah, uh, that... Dustin Hoffman was one of one of yep. the first. Me and my arrow, Dustin Hoffman, was the first movie star I remember doing a voice. But uh, so many did, and so many got paid for one movie as much as my dad made his whole life. <laughs> yep, it's it crazy. Amazing. When I when I heard that Reese Reese Witherspoon got eight million dollars for the voice she did for one movie, I said, "Oh my God." It's about a hundredth of what my dad made during his life. You know? <laughs> it's sad but true. Sad but true. <laughs> amazing. Oh, yeah. And they could pay the, uh, big prices to these stars uh, because they had an audience in the movies already. You know, when you had uh, Kirk Douglas doing a, a voice or uh, with, you know, Dustin Hoffman or Al Pacino, whoever it might have been, doing voices uh, for characters. Uh, they were paid these huge sums of money, and uh, uh, and they could put the name up on the marquee. Yep, which was very interesting. Yeah, and back in in your dad's day, you know, his name was the only one you saw, and that's why they remember his name. Yep, yep. And he was they they were giving him forty five dollars a week, oh, and he man. finally got them up to uh, sixty five dollars a week, <laughs> and they said, "Well, you know, we don't can't give you any more because you're only here shortly." The other animators never, they have to spend uh, all day here, seven days a week or five days a week. And uh, you come in for, uh, you know, half a day and do the voice. Uh, How can we pay you more? He says, well, the least you can do is at least give me credit on the the screen. So that was the key to it right there. When they gave him voice credit, moved his salary up to $65 a week, uh, then... Uh, people began to realize that there was one person doing all these voices. And that was amazing to them that uh, that he could, you know, do every voice that they heard. So radio uh, programs started using him too. At one time he was doing 18 radio shows a week. Hmm. And no not time for lunch or anything, just run, running between CBS and NBC and ABC right there in Hollywood and Vine area and Hollywood and Sunset, uh, Sunset and Vine rather, and CBS uh, on uh, Gower and Vine. They were all within a two or three block radius. And he was at a run a lot of the times. They'd hand him a script and he'd go in and, and do, he knew the character to do. Uh-huh. And uh, you could hear him on, at one time, if you can imagine, 18 radio shows a week. That's insane because, I mean, nowadays I can definitely see it because you have the internet. You can do things at home. But back in those sure. days, just back and forth from the studio is insane. He had to run to the studio, sure. <laughs> and uh, he would develop new voices on uh, when we take a vacation. I remember up in Montreal, Canada, we had a uh, Surrey driver, a Surrey with a fringe on top. And my mom and I and dad were sitting uh, in back of the, the driver. And he kept turning around and doing this incredible, strange dialect and voice. And we couldn't believe the voice he had, heard the dialect. And my dad was able to understand the dialect and copy it and became, you know, a cartoon character. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, But he never used any of the stars or radio stars at that time or movie stars to, uh, he he wasn't an imitator. All the voices he, he did were, his own original voice that he interpreted when he would see the drawing of the character. Yeah. So it was quite, quite amazing. Do you have like a, 
a favorite story about your dad that we haven't talked about yet? Gosh, there are so many wonderful stories. Um, let me see. Well, yeah, I, uh, I do have a couple. It's kind of interesting. A couple of short stories. When the heat, when CB radio came on, it was very big in the seventies. Everybody had a CB in their car before people had phones in their car. That was, that was a strange thing to have a phone in a car. And some people did, and they were usually, uh, broadcasters on the ham radio and they had a ham radio a telephone in their car and uh, very few of them had anything but cb and of course the truckers all had cb radios too and his uh, handle was of course bugs bunny <laughs> <clears throat> and he talked to the kids every day with a cb radio in the in the mid 70s and i remember i was in my jeep that had a big cb antenna big radio in it i was uh, in the rain, uh, going on uh, Wilshire Boulevard uh, east, and it was raining, and uh, I was going a 35 in a 25 mile an hour zone. Nobody on the else on the road, so I figured I can go a little faster. Uh-huh. And the big red light pulled up in back of me, and I was talking to my dad, and I said, "Gee, I've got the police in back of me." He says, "Well, are you pulling over?" I says, "Yeah, I'm pulling over now." I says, "I'm going to keep the mic open." And uh, the radio on. Do you mind? He says, no. And so I said, he's coming up to the window now. And all the policemen heard when he got to the window was, me, which I, I, which, you know, which up, Doc? Hi, Mr. Policeman. Please don't give my kid a ticket. And the, and the c- policeman started laughing. <laughs> he says, who is that? I said, that's my, he, my dad. And I key the mic. So the, the, my dad could hear the cross conversation. Yeah. He says, that's right, Doc. This is Bugs Bunny saying, do you have to give him a ticket for going 10 miles over the limit? He won't do it again, Doc. Uh, and the policeman was laughing so hard, of course, he didn't give me a ticket. And uh, that's how Bugs Bunny saved my from getting a ticket and my insurance rate from going up. So little that. things like that that were so that. always amazing. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Amazing. And, and, and <laughs> now this next question, you do not have to answer. Let me know if it's overstepping. After your dad passed, I know he kind of wanted you to take over. Your bugs is so great. Why didn't that happen? Well, it did for a little while. Okay. And it did when he had the uh, car accident in 1961. But nobody ever knew that. When he, when I would do any of the ways, I would make sure that nobody knew that I was doing any of it. So when he had the car accident for a while, I did bugs. Porky, Daffy, Tweety, um, but I, I don't think anybody knows that except a few people like yourself now. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, my bugs and Porky were pretty pretty good. Uh, they were all co- hey, we're all copies. He invented exactly. all those things, and the person and nobody can act and sing like he did, nor they, did they have the pair of vocal cords like he did. You know, he did fifteen hundred voices, so we all copied the voices. And I did for a while, and everything uh, was fun uh, after he passed away. But then uh, there were other people, all probably 20 or 25 of us, who were just as good, and uh, they could copy the voices quite uh, quite well. Bergman, yep. uh, especially. Yeah, and, Bergman's uh, great. Yeah, he's, he, he could do my dad's voice talking, which was interesting. Oh. He could sound like Mel talking. Wow, but uh, yeah, he's a very, he's a a great um, what we call it used to call him mimic. Uh, he can take a voice and really make. There were certain people like Walker Edmondson, people that you never heard of. There were great mimics also that were used to dub great radio shows, great television shows, and great movies. When uh, Orson Welles uh, couldn't talk anymore, you know, Paul Frees would move in and talk like Orson Welles, yep. or Walker Edmondson would come in and and talk like. Uh, uh, De Niro, Pacino, uh, Hoffman, Hackman, whoever it might be. They had that ear, uh, like uh, Rich Little. They could come in and imitate. And they didn't have to look and do perform like Rich Little. So their voice was key, and they sounded more like the person talking than, than anybody, but that nobody knew it was somebody like a Walker Edmonds, uh, which a name you've probably never heard of. It's, yeah, it's not. Because they never got credit for it. You know, you didn't want to say uh, part of Robert De Niro was played by Walker Edmonds. 
you know, sometime. <laughs> uh, that was a whole industry in itself, the dubbing of motion pictures. Uh -huh. But uh, my dad, there was nobody like Mel. He had a throat uh, that was uh, uh, so amazingly uh, subtle that could pick up all these different sounds. And yet his vocal cords, uh, after a camera was run down to see him, because this uh, larynx, larynologist wanted to see what the vocal cords looked like, and he said, my gosh, he's got a pair of vocal cords that we, we have the, a photograph of a Caruso's vocal cords very close to the musculature of uh, Enrico Caruso. Yeah, he had about a seven octave range, and uh, it was amazing what he could do with those vocal cords and never get hoarse. But uh, it was uh, it was a, a group see that he got the credit of being a man of the thousand voices. Yep. And yeah. to create all these voices. That was that was the difference in the people that, that you grew up with. Yep. That, uh, most of them would imitate um, stars that they had heard on the multiple channels of television that were at that time. Uh, when you grew up. When I grew up, there were only you know, three or four channels. <laughs> and the movie stars before that, during the heyday of radio, uh, were movie stars because you the people didn't have television and they went to the movies uh, two or three times a week. So you get 50 million people hearing a Bugs Bunny cartoon with their favorite movie. So that's how they became stars so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Bugs, Porky, Daffy, and the rest of them. Because they were on the screen when they saw that giant picture of Bugs and the movie star, their favorite movie star, along with Bugs Bunny, their favorite cartoon star. A whole different kind of uh, audience. Well, yeah. now you have thousands of channels. I know. I hate that. You know, it's, it's not the same. <laughs> you know, I, I, I. Well, it's not. Well, the star, the stars aren't the same. They're not. But they're not thirty feet tall, <laughs> and you see them twice a week, and that was it. <laughs> it's a whole different thing. Yeah, I kind of. Now uh, there's a star on every channel, so you have about. Uh, 4,300 stars at this. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, I wish my kids would be able to grow up in, you know, a better time for TV, radio, and animation. But, you know, it is what it is. And I still show them the classics. Well, oh, yeah. And there's still some great stuff out there, too. Yep, you know, there the Simpsons is. are terrific. Yep, uh, I agree. Really, a lot of good things. Um, some really cute animation, too, they can do now and make it look so real. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, there's some, there's some good stuff and there's some bad stuff, like there always was out there. But uh, not popular to a a little kid on the side of uh, the cartoons that were when we were kids. Very, very different. Very, movie stars, too. Yeah. Movie star was a movie star, you know, and that was it. There were very few major movie stars. Well, that's I've, I've used up a lot of your time. I think too much <laughs> well, of it already. This, and that time has been amazing, Noel. Thank you so very much. This has been a complete pleasure. That's and okay. An honor. And it's, oh, it's an honor talking to you too, because I know that you bring back memories to so many people. Yeah. And that's so important. That's what I so do. So continue working that way, Tim. And uh, Porky Pig would say, "Yes, yeah, the 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 the